but he made uh, he, he was in jail for two years before he was hanged by the Gestapo. And um, he made friends with all the guards. And um, because many, um, not, not everybody who worked for the government was a convinced Nazi. They were just in the government. Yeah. And so uh, almost all of the guards that he interacted with did little things for him. They smuggled in things and they smuggled out things. And um, even the person who was who had overall charge of this of the various prisons that he was at were somewhat sympathetic to him, although he never knew how much. And so he sometimes spoke in sort of code and referred to things that um, this person wouldn't necessarily have known what he was talking about. Just a quick story. I was watching a movie yesterday. There are so there's about three or four. If you go to YouTube, even if you don't pay for YouTube, you just go and say, oh, at least on my screen, I don't pay for YouTube, but I just go to that. It says you and then a visitor. So I always sign in as a visitor. And then YouTube lets you go straight to all the hundreds of movies that they have, even if you don't pay for YouTube. So I was watching one yesterday, a couple hours in the afternoon, and um, they're, they're just extraordinary films that have been made about him. Just a quick one about his fiance, Maria van Vedemeyer. She was there, they smuggled her in, and all the way we would see in, in a prison today, where the guard keeps saying, now talk loud because you know we're supposed to hear everything you say, make sure you're not plotting. And then at the end of it, he, they, they ushered him to his uh, going back to the cell and her going back to public. And as she's being led there, she turns around and she, I'm going to cry it out. She turns around and she sees him and she races across the room and gives him a big hug. <laughs> and that will be the last time she sees him. And then uh, it's some time before his family even discovers that he is dead. And the way they discover that is that uh, he was very good friends with uh, one of the bishops in the Anglican church. And because he, he hoped that um, through ecumenical, through the ecumenical movement, so Lutherans, Anglicans, Catholics, and so forth, maybe they could exercise some influence on the German government and on the unseating of Hitler. So some time after he died, his family happened to be watching a show from the, from the, from the UK, and it was a service in honor of his martyrdom. And they didn't even know it. They didn't know he was dead. And then there was this service that is um, quite extraordinary. Nice. Um, so ethics is maybe his more substantial work that maybe uh, scholars and maybe people in the seminary or even in college, uh, a religious studies department might read, but they're not nearly as popular as Life Together and Cost of Discipleship. Um, Life Together, you know, Carolyn, you need to stay up here, so I, if, oh, am I still talking? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> So Life Together is maybe his most beloved work. I read it long ago in seminary, and I just read it again last week. And um, it's so moving, but um, let's just get to it. It's so moving, but it might be hard to see how you could get there today. Except as I was sitting there at the end of the service this morning, 
and even during the sermon and during Dad's uh, end of the service and during Dad's uh, sermon and during the uh, antiphonal chanting of the Psalms, there were things that Bonhoeffer was very big on. He himself was a musician, maybe not a professional musician, but quite a good pianist. And in the underground seminary, they uh, were constantly on the piano and so forth. But when I read it again, I thought, how am I going to, how are we going to discuss this? Because we are so far from the kind of experience he had. And uh, so remember, this is, so this is, this is happening in Northeastern Germany, not so far from Berlin, but a bit out in the boonies. And there are about uh, 25 seminary students. And this is the seminary that the confessing church, which was quite dissatisfied with the general uh, Protestant tradition, the ones who called, who, who called themselves the German Christians, the Deutsche Christen, they, they called themselves that. And they, and they wanted to emphasize the fact that they were Germans maybe even Germans first of all, and then, oh yeah, Christians too. Uh, and so the Confessing Church emerged in opposition to that. And they thought that you couldn't depend on the seminary that was always connected to the university that would be training the pastors of the German Protestantism. You couldn't de depend on those people taking the kind of stand that you wanted people to take. So it was hence an underground seminary and selected just because of the confessing church. Um, but it also provided an extraordinary opportunity for Bonhoeffer to sort of act things out the way he perceived the church to be. And I was reminded, I, 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 of course, knew that his dissertation, which he wrote when he was 21 years old at the University of Berlin, his dis dissertation was called Communio Sanctorum, Communion of Saints. And he, the genre of his dissertation was not, as you might have thought it would be, New Testament theology. Of course, it was influenced by New Testament theology, but the genre to which he belonged, to which his dissertation belonged, was sociology of religion, which warmed my heart, happens to be mine as well. Um, and so it was really a dissertation about, given the New Testament, given the Sermon on the Mount, given the, the way we experience Jesus in the New Testament, how would we act that out? How, and so sociology and religion, how could it take a social shape so that you'd say, wow, that kind of reminds you of Jesus, doesn't it? And, and that, was a, that was the whole point, that the church, so, so the, and, and then the, the other kind of sub, Was that word subtext of, of the title uh, Christus aus Gemeinde existieren Christ exists today in the community of the church like us so the way Christ exists on a Sunday morning is through us now the more ticklish part cost of discipleship is well but how does he exist then during the week how does Christ exist during the week? And that's where it gets trickier. But we'll start with how does he exist in the community? Now, Bonhoeffer was able to go so far because there was this tiny little group of people and they were off, they weren't connected with the university anymore. They were off on their own. And um, you could really do anything. So what he, in effect, did is he created a monastic movement. And even many people in the confessing church weren't at all pleased with that. I mean, they were pure Lutherans. And they were saying to themselves, wait a minute, 
Luther left the monastery, right, um, in 1517, 20, and so forth. Uh, Luther left the monastery because he thought the monastery, in a sense, had accepted the charge of Christ existing as community, so nobody else would have to. So the church could look at monasteries and say, well, they're doing it for us. They are as pure as you can get to, to embody the presence of Christ in the modern world, but not the church at large. They're, you, you just can't expect that of them. So Bonhoeffer then seems to be reproducing a monastic sensitivity in this um, underground seminary. And I, I kept thinking as I was reading it, well, we can't expect we're going to do that. I mean, what are the chances we would have to be meeting every day, all day long, uh, all month long, all year long? So that's simply out of the question. These, these students weren't married. There weren't children there. And so the extraordinary sensibility that they could produce uh, simply is not reproducible today. But then I wrote myself a note, and it's, it's on your um, sheets, that we, 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 we don't want to rush to get a, a, a get out of jail free. Like, well, of course he could do it. I mean, they were off in the boonies, and there were only 30 students plus Bonhoeffer, and they had to do everything that Bonhoeffer said because he was the boss, he was the teacher, he was the monastic leader. And then they had, so then I thought to myself, have I had any experiences like this? And I realized, yeah, when I was in seminary. Um, so my life in seminary was every morning, at 10 or 10.30, the entire seminary, and there were several hundred of us, not 30, the entire seminary went to chapel. I was often the chapel organist. Went to chapel, and then back to class, and the classes that we were all in were about Christian doctrine and pastoral care. So we could get pretty close to what Bonhoeffer was up to. Some of us were married, although in those days, in the Missouri Synod at least, when I, which I was in then, before you could get married, you had to get permission from the dean. So like, what? Um, so there was that much control. You know, we were a special group of people off on our own, although we were in the middle of St. Louis, but we were off on our own. And so then I thought, yeah, but you can't produce that. You can't reproduce that here. But then I sat there again this morning thinking, well, there are things that can be done. So Bonhoeffer was uh, particularly, uh, as, as monks do, in a monastery, even today, you chant the entire 150 psalms and you work through them every couple of weeks. All your life, uh, you go through the you go through the psalms, and um, the way we're doing the psalms, we do this in, in Chico too, where I live slightly more of the year. Uh, I don't think we're doing it because Bon never suggested that was a good way to do it, but maybe a musician or maybe the pastor, whoever the minister of music. Uh, there was a sense that when you do things when you antiphonally do them, you do a verse, I do a verse, you do a verse, I do a verse, that there's a kind of coming together around the text of the Psalms. And they did that many times a day in Bonhoeffer's underground seminary, and they typically did it antiphonally. And um, probably when most of us if were lifelong Lutherans, we haven't been doing it that way. We're only doing it that way lately. 
I think that's true. Is it true, Sherry, that it, we're, yeah, we're only doing it here lately and in Chico, um, where Carolyn and I live seven months of the year, we've only been doing it lately as well. And the idea is that if you toss it back and forth, there's a kind of communalism that arises around the way you do the sounds. And then uh, I know maybe more about the Chico Church than I do about this one, although I know a lot about this one. But uh, there are there are prayers there, mostly women belong these. Maybe that's because many of the women, oh, that's different today, but maybe more of the women are not employed outside the home than they the way Trump thinks they all should be. Um, <laughs> and so it's easier for women to have a circle in which they come. We even have a sign in, in Chico, prayer circle, and that is the room among the church rooms where anybody who wants to can come a couple times a week and pray together. Well, that's a kind of approximation of what Bonhoeffer was doing. And uh, so you, you, you can do it. Uh, but let me, so I don't end up doing all the talking as I did last Sunday, sorry. Let me ask you, uh, do you see things happening at Agnes Day that are suggestive of a community coming together, obviously on Sunday morning, but uh, oftener than that, what do you think? That's good. Wednesday's text of yeah. Okay, that's yeah. And and then is that the one where you talk talk it through with the pastors, the text that are being yeah, and that's a fairly new thing that Lutherans are doing, I think. Theology. Maybe a lot of Theology on tap. Yeah, theology on tap. So that's a kind of German dimension to the tap part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so don't chant them. You don't, you don't, you don't, don't, don't chant them. Yeah. 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 Closing the choir. Okay, fellowship breakfast. <laughs> so there's really maybe more things than, and then the um, the backpack for kids. On the one hand, that's a good work cost of discipleship, but on the other hand, I would guess the people who come together to do that are experiencing a certain sense of communalism. And so if you, if you think about it, it could be there's more to it than we typically think, and maybe even if we're lifelong Lutherans, we're doing it now more than we used to do it. Although I can remember uh, my mother in Dubuque, uh, they have circles the way we have circles today, women's circles. And uh, women would take turns uh, housing, uh, sponsoring the circle at, uh, the, uh, at, at our house. Okay, quick story. There was one woman who was a little flashy or a Lutheran <laughs> woman. <laughs> And uh, it was always, my dad would always say, did, uh, did Dolores come to your circle? And my mother said, yeah, not only did she come to the circle, but there were some garbage men working out, and they all whistled when she came into our house. <laughs> and my father said, don't let that happen again. <laughs> so, and they really like their it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's these little things that we, we remember. But anyway, it could be we could do more of this than we, than we do now. Uh, I don't happen to know, I know more about Chico, but uh, you go on retreats. Uh, and when Lutherans in California go on retreat, they often do it. It's run by Catholics, because Catholics are better at it. And sometimes they actually do it at a monastery, or um, at least uh, women don't live in monastic settings so much as men do in the Catholic tradition. But women might still have retreat capabilities, and Lutherans in California often avail themselves of that. 
and uh, they come back refreshed spiritually and it kind of gives a charge to everybody and uh, these are things again that a sociologist would say well of course i get that and, and again that's about never showing through the way jesus is present is in the social groups that we form that imitate him we're imitating christ he is the way we exist. I think the care team is an excellent example of that too, because it's home communion, it's ride chairs, it's delivering meals, it's you know visitation. That's yeah. all community. Yeah, and that's fairly new here. Yeah, and, uh, I don't think we do this here, but in Chico, every Sunday uh, as communion is about to begin, uh, the pastor says, "Now so and so." It's always a woman, not sure why. Uh, so and so, she will be uh, standing at the back of the church. And when you come back down the aisle from communion, if you feel the need for prayer, she'll be the person who takes care of that. And it's a different woman, sometimes a man, but, uh, but almost always a woman. And a different woman will do that every Sunday. And again, that is a way that you are making sure that uh, you can extend, you can deepen this sense of communion. And then uh, we do this, uh, and we do it up here, but I'm not, I haven't seen it done lately. Yeah, we do it. Where, you, where the pastor hands out a, a, a communion kit to women who are going to take communion out into the yeah, out uh, uh, to the uh, extended boundaries of the parish. So the, there are all these things that we do, and maybe the only the, the, the use of boundaries rather than say, well, of course, we'll never get it, never get to be as good as he did because you know he did, he actually created a little monastery there. Instead, you could say, well, look at all the boundaries, and stuff that we do. Uh, we can be quite pleased. Uh, with ourselves. Um, so, um, well, I guess I've just talked about that. Oh, Luther, probably most Lutherans, Lutheran who aren't clergy, don't know this, but we, we think of Catholics as having seven sacraments and all of Protestants as having two sacraments, baptism and communion. Most people don't know that Luther said, well, you know, you really need a third one. Um, and that's the um, communion of saints being enacted in the life of the parish. Again, anticipating Bonhoeffer, but this is 400 years earlier when, when, when Luther did it. So Luther called this third sacrament the communal consolation of the brethren. Uh, today we would make sure that was a, a word that included both men and women. Um, but uh, that's an interesting thing that Luther came up with. He, he just thought, maybe we don't want to have seven sacraments like Catholics do, but two isn't maybe quite enough because um, we want these other things going on as well. And um, Bonhoeffer even, now imagine this, pretty sure we don't do this. But Bonhoeffer said, you know, why should we have to um, confess our sins to a priest, like if we were Catholic, and then the priest announces in the name of Christ the forgiveness of our sins, and again, you can imagine this maybe happening in Bon Everest Underground Seminary, but are we up for this? So what if each Sunday before we did the confession of sins, uh, the pastor said, well, let's all form in groups of two and confess our sins to each other. Three, yeah. I can't confess all my sins. 
You can or you can't. You cannot. Well, there wouldn't be enough time for them, right? No, no, no. Oh. You know, I say boldly. Everything yeah. comes out. Okay, all right. Boy, you must be a lifelong Lutheran, if you know. Oh, come on. My great plus grandfather signed the alms for confession. Yeah, all right. Okay. Oh, you know. I even know the Latin for that. Pecca fortiter. Sin boldly. L Luther said, don't get all this obsessed constantly, constantly. Oh, I wonder if this would be a sin. Get out and live your life boldly. Sin, if you want to call it that, boldly. But anyway, I, I'm not suggesting we would try to do this, but Bonhoeffer thought it would be a good idea. Get all these seminarians, so that would be 15 groups to, in each group, and they would confess their sins to each other. And no, notice that that is not only a bold thing for the confessor, but for the person who says, in the name of Jesus, I forgive your sins, that kind of uh, encourages everybody to get used to that. Like now, in a sense, we do get used to it because we do act it out in a way by saying some of these things. But, um, so any other, oh, I just wanted to say the, the, uh, the first pastor that I knew well in Chico, when it was time for his sabbatical, <laughs> typically pastors seem to get maybe three months sabbatical. One of his uh, sabbatical months, he went out to a monastery, which is 20 miles north of Chico, I take my students there every, took, took my students there every year, and it always just impressed them like crazy, like, whoa. And there was a man, there was a monk who took a liking to us, and he always made sure that he got to do the, um, the presentation of what monks are, what monks are all about. But this, uh, the, the, so the pastor went there, I was just talking to him about this again several months ago, when he was in Chico. It was the best sabbatical he thought he had ever had. Uh, I think maybe he made a small contribution because he was eating with the monks and so forth. And then there was housing. So it wasn't that he drove there every day. He went and lived there for a month. That would be something that men in this parish could do if there are monasteries, since his monasteries are mostly all men, it would not be possible for a woman to live in the monastery. Although the monastery outside of Chico has a place a bit off the monastic grounds where women on retreat, uh, maybe like for weekends, could come. It would be a little trippy to have them come for a whole month. There's a convent of nuns in Olympia, yes. and I went there for a week after my mother died. That was quite an experience. Wow. Oh. So, like, uh, we could go there. Yeah. And of course, the idea is that it rubs off on you. And you think, wow, this is, a, we, we, we really are living out the presence of Christ in our lives today. Now, when we get to the cost of discipleship, Bonhoeffer would say, yeah, and where else is this happening? Do you go to Olympia, not to the women's monastic movement, but to the uh, legislature? Whoa. Um, so uh, Bonhoeffer would have thought that that would be something that you like. Now, in his day, it had to be underground because it was a counter movement. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm running out of time here, so maybe this is enough for this. But uh, it, if it leaves you with anything, it's just, you know, whether you're on the council, whether you're forming uh, Bible studies, whether you're doing this, whether you're doing that, are you looking for ways to um, be the presence of Christ with one another? I remember when I was a kid, it always impressed my father and me and my mother tremendously. We rarely went out to eat because we couldn't afford it, but if we did, 
And we saw a family at the next table praying, come Lord Jesus, be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. In a, in a, in a restaurant, we, we were quite pious, but we never quite did that. My, my dad just couldn't, couldn't bring himself to do that. But there are all these things that could be done that are examples, and um, I don't have time to get to, to, to this, but one way to say, to do some of the things that Bonhoeffer did is to do more than just Lutheran stuff. Uh, I love to tell stories about Pentecostals. You know, Lutherans don't go forward. You can't heal a Lutheran, all those stories that I've learned in my <laughs> seminary period. But other groups of Christians, other denominations might uh, be doing some things better than we do, and why not just do them? Uh, there's a, there's a, a scholar at Stanford, um, is she an anthropologist? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she, uh, I knew that. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I really need to have these things glued to me. <laughs> Maybe station. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. Okay. okay, we'll just see if it's that. Um, so she, she, she has written several, at least two books. She, she does a participant observation in Pentecostal groups. And she has written very best-selling books, at least in anthropology of religion. And just watching, and so you wonder if people watch Lutherans, what would they conclude Christianity is all about? So when she watched and lived with Pentecostals, she developed a whole um, theoretical construction of what it means to be a Christian based on the way Pentecostals act. And as, I'm sure she never heard about it ever, but she, her book is about how you develop a sense. It, it's the, and she's unusual as an anthropologist because she doesn't say, of course, I don't believe in this crap. I, I'm just writing about it. No, she writes about it so approvingly and so knowingly that it makes you wonder by the time she finished writing this book, had she become a Pentecostal Christian? I don't think she had, but she had a tremendous openness to it. And um, she, she, the, the, the thesis of the book is, if you're a Pentecostal Christian, you see the world differently. You experience the world differently. You act it out differently. Well, maybe that's true of us too. It would just be some different things. What's her name? Um, Tanya Lorman. What? Lorman. Yeah, T T T M Lorman. L U H R M A N. Yeah, and what's the name of the book? She has two books. I quote them extensively in my own book, but at my age, I'm losing things a lot. Yeah, understand. I think one of the difficulties that we have with those rituals is they become meaningless. Come on, Jesus, be my guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. What did I say? Uh, we can certainly do that with the Lord's Prayer. But then, you know, we once again thee today. Us, good Lord. But, we beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That was another one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way um, when, when, when uh, Lurman uh, de de deals with that, because everybody says, oh, well, sure, this is just, <coughs> just wrote. People don't believe what they're doing, do they? It'd be impossible. And uh, he says no, because they have constructed the reality of the world in a way that is unique to them so that their religion works and so that God works for them. God is, in, is a kind of external dimension to their life. And uh, Bonhoeffer would have, uh, would have understood that as well.
Um, so the cost of discipleship, there it is. <laughs> You know, I have an awfully loud voice, maybe. Oh, is this for the people? No, at home? Yeah, they will hear everything. As long as the people hear you, we're good. Okay, so let's take this off. Right. No. No, 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 okay. I will try to really wrap it up. Oh, okay. 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 Really, I, are you telling me you can't hear me back there? How about some? How about some? Uh, the able to put it <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to say so entertaining this morning. Okay, you know, nobody else is. See, I've got a hearing aid in there too. That's what that really picks up. Uh, so uh, I'll just try to pick out a couple of the things in the cost of discipleship. The one that has always particularly interested me is that it's not a book that Luther probably would have written. Uh, at this point, when Luther is in some ways trying to undo about the last thousand years of Catholic Christianity, he clings to Galatians and Romans as the heart of the biblical message. I think I mentioned uh, last Sunday, Luther wasn't much into Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He'd always, he always thought they sounded too much like works, works righteousness, that, that they were so much into good works. Well, wait a minute, where's, where's the Pauline grace? How can we be sure that we are saying, hey, the reason we're saved is because God freely offers this to us. It's not because we have so many things going on in the women's circle or so many backpacks for children or, or whatever, or even the, the announcements that were made this morning. Those aren't why we're being saved. And so Luther was so worried about people might think that that would why we were, why we're being saved, is that he sort of reduced the emphasis on that, although he did take it up with the German princes and told them what their responsibility should be, would be different because they were all, of course, Luther, and they had become Luther. So it would be different than today writing the governor um, and saying this and this and this is your responsibility because we don't speak to the governor as fellow Christians, even if the governor were Christian. Um, but the, the question is, are we so good at justification that we aren't so good at sanctification? So justification is God graces you and you say, thank you, Lord, for giving this freely, not because of my own earning it. And then sanctification is, but now I am living such a grateful life that I live a, 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 a life of rich uh, exercise of my faith, what we were talking about 10 minutes ago, in, in a way that is um, really important and that the community would see, oh yeah, you know those Christians. So these days, uh, if you happen to be a Christian living in Texas on the border, you can be arrested for providing water to very thirsty pilgrims yeah. who are sort of uh, lost in the wilderness on one or the other side of the river that separates Texas from there. You can be arrested for that. And maybe you can say, oh, well, of course, then we wouldn't do it. Or you would say, that's definitely why I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And uh, in, there have been some places in the United States where parishes have taken in people and fed them and maybe even housed them, and they were arrested for that. Now, not always, because it often happens and you don't get arrested for it. But that would be an example of the cost of discipleship in which we would uh, really say, hey, this is something we really need to be doing. And then this last one, I must say, I stumble over it every time I read it. I suppose I've read it once once a time in my life, ever since I was in seminary. Only he who believes is obedient. Only he who is obedient believes. It's not quite the kind of thing Luther would have said, because it's the second half of it. Wait a minute, only he who 
who is obedient believes. Do you mean you're saved because you're obedient? No, Barnabas not saying you're saved. He's saying that's the way you exercise your belief. Um, and in case there were any doubt, if you are a believer, then what you do is you are obedient. You are obedient to the call of Christ. So it's reciprocal, and it goes back and forth. If you're justified, you live a sanctified life. If you live a sanctified life, you keep going to God for grace because of all the ways that you fail and keep asking for, for more help. Um, bon never. There's another way of describing that. that uh, when we think of life as a gift, okay, You've been given, and the way you live then is as a gift. Yes, yes, he would have loved it. Yeah, you are acting out. Um, you know, don't we hope our children act out the love and sustenance that we have given them, and they act it out in a way that is um, just what you think would happen. They're, they're sort of carrying it out. And, and Bonhoeffer is saying, you carry it out, and um, that's just the way it takes effect. First, and, 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 he, and since Bonhoeffer is uh, writing this, uh, it's really, his, his cost of discipleship is really about a 200 page uh, interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. Lutherans don't do much with the Sermon on the Mount. For one thing, it seems impossible. Like, really? I mean, maybe in Jesus' head it could be true, but blessed are those who, and blessed are those who, and blessed are those who, and we might say, where? Where, where would that be happening? And of course, one never says, well, it's because you're making it happen, right? You are acting out Jesus' ministry. Um, and so Bonner goes over and over. The simple thing that actually worked for me a little bit again this time around, uh, they left, Jesus called, and the fishermen left their nets and followed him. Well, there it is. That, that's the, the summation. The call is a gracious call and the response is obedience. God, I'm entrusting myself to you. I'm putting down my net. I'm giving up being a fisherman, and I'm now following you. And Bonham said, don't, don't necessarily think you have to make a separation, because now, now, wait a minute, you get, are you getting credit for leaving your nets? No, they just go together. Jesus calls, that's grace. They left their nets and followed. That's the good works of the Christian life. Um, in the Garden of Eden, Bonhoeffer says, and maybe all of us could see this, God comes down and says, you know, he, he, he makes a little um, statue or something out of the dust of the earth, and God kind of looks at it and says, yeah, yeah, that could represent me on earth. So Darth Bonhoeffer says, God is calling Adam to be his representative on earth. And then um, the grace part, God says, would you like to live in my garden here, free of charge? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't mean to see it free of charge. Mm -hmm. Would you like to live in my garden here? And Adam initially says yes, until he realizes the cost of discipleship and the temptations and so forth. But the, the back and the forth, Bonhoeffer says, whether it's happening with Jesus calling the fishermen or God creating humans to be the representative of God on earth. Um, I'm going to skip and go on to this. So you wouldn't find Lutherans in the 18th century to have written Wesley's, Wesley's Manifesto. Uh, Lutherans never invented Salvation Army either. 
We would find little word that maybe they were works righteousness or something. Or, well, wait a minute, what, those Salvation Army stores? Are you, are you, are you saying that's part of a representative of, of Jesus being present on earth? But to think that this is in the 18th century, whereas today, could be a little through today too, a Christian who believes in social justice, in the way that you are called to, um, to see in the least of these the presence of Jesus. That's Matthew 25 rather than the Sermon on the Mount. So when you see the hungry or the thirsty or the imprisoned or the nut jobs or the addicted people, and you say, you know, if you look hard, you see Jesus there right, right with them. So you need to sort of start ministering to Jesus in his presence with them. And, yeah. But the little thing's getting in bed, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that, okay. It was the Oxford group who had the six steps, and then Bob and Bill took the six steps and, and separated them. But the new friends first said that alcoholism is not a sin, it's an addiction, it's it's a All right. sickness, and Lutherans and Vena AA. Everybody give themselves a pat on the back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I yeah, I don't mean to do I mean it's only because I'm a lifelong Lutheran that I can sort of be critical of them, because maybe we often praise ourselves too much. But yeah. it is the case that acting out in terms of social justice is something more common among Methodists and Presbyterians, I think, than it is among Lutherans, although not lately so much. It could be that lately Lutherans are doing this as well. But to think that in the 18th century, and when Wesley wrote this, he said, in effect, wait a minute, where are Lutherans on this? Why, why did I have to write this? But how come I'm not seeing Lutherans do this? And Wesley knowingly said, Lutherans are hot on justification and cool on sanctification. You need to be hot on both of them. You need to exercise the presence of Christ that graces you in the way you respond to the world. Now, to give ourselves some credit, I wrote to Dan, uh, sent an email to Dan, couple weeks ago, where do we get these the reciprocal prayers that we get? And he told me, you know, often, sometimes they come from people who have that assignment in, in the parish. Sometimes they come from ELCA headquarters in Chicago. Sometimes you might just get them from, from books you read. But let's be clear, there are many conservative Christian nationalists who wouldn't be caught dead saying some of the prayers that we say on Sunday morning. Even today, what, we're praying for Puget Sound and for the whales that live in it? What's that about, these people would be saying? Well, it's because God calls us to that, because Adam's in the garden and he's supposed to be taking care of it. And so we are, in fact, uh, I don't have to know the story for sure, but I think about five years ago, these prayers that we pray were getting so radical that a couple of people threatened to quit. Some of you will know this story better than I do because I didn't really get in on it. But, um, and went to the pastor and said, who's ever writing these prayers, tell them to quit writing or tell them to write prayers that we can all believe in. Not, not all this good work stuff and, take care of the environment, and what about the birds and the whales and, and the poor people and the people crossing the border in Texas? What about all those people? We're not going to be putting those in our prayers on Sunday mornings, but we do. And we do to an extraordinary extent that just amazes me. And so lately, the last couple of months, I've been watching for all the stuff we put in those prayers. And I know uh, Kathy mentioned to me when I said, I, when could I preach, when could I do this uh, series, that the September series 
is uh, creation care. And that's a new thing. When I was a boy, you know Lutherans were doing creation care. We weren't praying, we weren't praying for the Mississippi. Um, and so it, we, we really are doing some things, more time for adding you, adding you stuff on the back. We are doing more things that um, are really, and, and of course, if you keep praying for things, pretty soon you start believing the things that you're praying for. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work. And so you say, uh, wow, I can't just write this off. I mean, I just prayed, prayed for it last Sunday. Are we going to withdraw that prayer? Or are we going to have to exercise me so I start sounding and acting like the prayers we're praying on Sunday? And you could even have, and I don't know how we do this exactly, but the new pastor could, uh, could even have um, a, a prayer group Maybe, I think maybe you already have that, in which uh, committees of people write prayers for the bulletin and the liturgy every Sunday. And you say, wow, and, and surely the people who do that must say to themselves, well, are we covering everything here? Because um, let's face it, we are not exactly uh, swarming with poor people in Vietnam. We're pretty uppity down here. It's where rich people for rich people come to retire and so forth. Oh yeah, I'm just kidding there. Yeah. I, I, I want everyone to know that the food bank where I volunteer, since they started the new building, since it was finished, the, the uh, numbers have tripled. The numbers have tripled of the clients who come in for help wow. for food. So, if so there they, are a lot of people around here that are invisible, good point. that are not well off or even middle class. All right. So let's let, let, let's say that it could, yeah, Carolyn was saying, don't make these people stay. That's their punishment for taking <laughs> so um, What was I? I'm oh, sorry, I got you off track. Before I start yelling at me. Um, so, oh, oh I, I want to say, instead of saying, oh, you know, so many people are doing it better than Lutherans. Okay, in some cases that might be true, but in other cases, I'm trying to suggest, there's a lot to congratulate ourselves on for actually living as if we were Christ's representatives. Now, let me just see what else. Oh, and this is the rest of the Wesleyan. By the way, if you just Google this, it, it's there. Everything is on Google. So, yeah. it, including the Wesleyan Manifesto, and there'll be articles on it and so forth. There's, there's a danger to this whole concept of representing God. Uh, our, our, our human nature ends up, we're replacing God. Yes. I'm God. Yes. I can do it my way. This is for me. Well said. You know? And that's the critique of Christian nationalism. That is really not so much about God as rah rah America. And then he sort of sort of got exactly the reverse point, the wrong point. So I'll just close the Barman Declaration. This is the great 1934 statement of the Confessing Church, in which again you can um because this is all we're doing on this now, you you can if you if you Google Barman Declaration It'll have page after page of uh, articles about the Barman Declaration and what they were saying and how they stood up uh, in the face of uh, National Socialism and so forth. And uh, I'm okay. Okay. Well, this is all on your paper, so let me just. Um, Oh, so, so, so let me just go back to the first. So the first thesis is, we reject the false doctrine that the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its a proclamation. Never mind, I think that's getting wrong. Um, Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, righteousness, and sacrifice. We reject the false, so what it means and what it doesn't mean. So it's a very, very famous thing. Luther, it, it hasn't become, Part of uh, in Germany, 
uh, the Barman and, and German Protestantism, the Barman Declaration is one, it has um, confessional status. So um, along with the Apostles' Creed and so forth, there's the Barman Declaration, which, which is experienced as a tremendously important assertion that the ideology embraced by Hitler is not what the church stands for, and the church stands for the opposite of that, and we're saying that out loud, including if we end up dying for it. And so it became a tremendously important issue. And um, next Sunday, we'll say, well, do we need a new Barman Declaration on anything? Is there anything we should be saying today no one else is saying it, so it looks like it's time for us we'll to say it. Tuesday. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go <laughs> us. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, Lutherans tend to say, hey, wait a minute, we got enough confessions. The Oxford Confession of, of, of uh, 1530 is the Lutheran confessional document. And uh, when Dan became ordained, when I became ordained, we sort of swore allegiance to the Lutheran Confessions. The Presbyterians said, yeah, okay, that's cool. And now in 1934, we needed yet another confession, and that's the Barman Declaration. But Lutherans in Germany were so, hey, you know, we got one of these, we don't need that many. It wasn't that they disagreed with it, but they didn't want to elevate it to confessional status. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll um, this, this will be a subject next Sunday. Do we need, okay, Carolyn, do we need a new Barman Declaration? Uh, if so, what would it be? Thank you very much. I I had a very good friend that we were